good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you all this morning? Yeah. Happy Mother's Day. All right. Pastor, are there announcements this morning? Well, I, I see one um, very good visual reminder there. Yeah, me too. The, uh, Hearing that pregnancy? Well, if you notice, we've got some wonderful bottles right here in just wonderful colors. We would like you to take one home today, and we'd, we'd like you to put your change in it, or you can write a check and stick it in, whatever you'd like. Uh, a check will fit. You can just roll it up and stick it right in. This is for the CareNet pregnancy. And they, uh, you're going to bring it back on Father's Day. So you take it home on Mother's Day, bring it home back on Father's Day, filled to the brim. You can either take, even take two if you'd like. That'll be wonderful too. But it does great stuff, y'all. You know, these are girls who would otherwise maybe do the unthinkable and they're giving birth to these children so that they can be adopted out or they decide, you know, CareNet pregnancy helps them decide, hey, I'm going to keep the baby. And they do such wonderful things. They counsel, they give them diapers, they help them with so much. So your donation in these bottles will do more than you ever know. So think of this bottle as a little baby mm. brought into the world. All right. Any other announcements this morning? Anybody? I know we've got one more uh, Wednesday night supper, right? Is Monica doing this week? Uh, Monica Rich is our, our pastoral um, care. pastoral care. Thank you. I couldn't think of the word. Uh, she's going to be presenting a program on Wednesday night. So there's supper and a, and a program. And uh, are there any other announcements? Anything? I can't think of anything else. Yes. Oh, Celia. <gasps> VBS. So VBS June 10th, 17th, 17th through 21st. And are you pre-registering or are we just having people? Yes. Sorry, it's the last week of May. Okay, okay. Last week of May. Anything else? Pastor Jim, any other announcements? Anything? Okay. All right. As you're willing, as you're able, will you stand and join us? Our first song is one that's uh, new to us. It's Whom Shall I Fear? We're going to do it this week, and we'll do it next week, too, so it'll give us a little practice. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who
this morning in the name of Christ. Feel free to walk up and get your baby bottle. Oh, get your baby bottles. And please sign the friendship pads. Yeah. Baby bottles. Get your baby bottles. Joy, get your baby bottles. this morning all right as you're willing as you're able will you stand and join us our next song this morning is give me jesus In the morning 
when I come to die, oh, and when I come to die, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Lord, that is what we need. We need more of you and less of us. Help us as we strive towards that. Jesus, we come this morning thanking you especially for mothers. For most of us, that is the first face of Jesus that we see and know. Lord, we can never thank you enough for the mothers who have given so much for all of us. We thank you, Lord, and we ask a special blessing over them today, the mothers and the grandmothers and the women who stepped in for the mothers who couldn't do it themselves. Thank you, Lord. What a blessing it is for mothers. We ask for a special peace, Lord, for those of us who are missing their mothers today. And Lord, in addition, we ask a blessing on the women among us who will be mothers yet. We pray that you guide them, make their paths smooth and straight, give them strength. For the mothers, the women who've acted as mothers, and the women who will be mothers. Lord, for all this, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mother's Day, and we wish all of you a very happy Mother's Day. I, ooh, I'm hot on two, Toby. Um, have a, a rose for the oldest mother present in this service. <laughs> okay, pull me down on the mains just a little bit more. Okay, uh, wait, Marie, i, I got to play my game here, okay? Uh, if you're if you're older than 30, hold your hand up. Okay, okay. mother's present. If you're older than 40, keep your hand up. Okay, if you're older than 50, keep your hand up. If you're older than 60, keep your hand up. If you're older than uh, that's got it. Okay, <laughs> well, we we can, we can stop there, Marie. You're older than 60, and you, you get the rose for being the oldest mother present this morning. So, all right. There you go. And happy Mother's Day. And we also have for every lady and woman and girl present, for all of those of the female persuasion, okay? If you will please stand, we want to honor you and, uh, and give you a chocolate bar. Now, several people, keep your seat, Tim, keep your seat. Uh, several people asked me uh, a while back, I mean, the first year I was here, I was telling Ross, first year I was here, we... Uh, we gave, I guess the tradition had been to give carnations to, to all the ladies present. And at Father's Day, we gave chocolate bars. And there arose a distress in the land. Ross, would you take that back to Rachel? There was a great cry heard in the land. Why do we get carnations and they get chocolate bars? You can't eat carnations. So we, uh, we decided to go with chocolate on Mother's Day. So. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to everybody. And today's, uh, I, I want to take um, the story of Moses and his birth, a man who had two mothers. 
Now, I think there might be some interesting things that will, that will come out of this uh, for you. And our text is going to be that passage in Exodus where Jochebed, who is Moses' mother, uh, is revealed to us for the first time. They don't give his father's name. It's kind of interesting. He was of the tribe of Levi. Um, and, of course, Moses was the, uh, was the lawgiver for the children of Israel. And uh, they just say that, that, uh, uh, that a man of Levi took a, took a woman of the tribe of Levi. Later on, we find out that her name is Jochebed, and it's Moses' mother. Now, you, you've heard this story from the time that you were little, probably. I heard it in Sunday school or read it in Bible story books and so on. But it comes from Exodus chapter 2, uh, beginning to read at verse 1. We'll read down through verse 10. And this is what it says there. It says, And the man of the house of Levi went and took as a wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of the Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. And may God add the blessing of understanding the reading of his word. Now, in order to set this in a proper context, uh, I need for you to understand a couple things, and then we'll share some, some observations about mothers and Mother's Day. But we need to understand that there was a, a group um, of people from the middle of Africa that came and, and took over the major Egyptian civilization. In other words, the, the children of Israel had been in Egypt um, by this time um, about 430 years. Now, think about that, because we've been a nation about 230 years. And uh, so 430 years they've been in the land of Egypt. Most of that time they've been in slavery. But these people who came from the south uh, and, and took over the king, the Cushites took over the kingdom of Egypt. And this is, this is pretty much secular history recorded that verifies a lot of these things that we, that we read in the Bible. Um, and when they took over, uh, the, the word just simply says in the first chapter of the book of Exodus, says there arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And what that means and what you don't understand is that there was a major conflict of civilizations there. One took over the other, what had been ancient Egypt. Now, that being the fact then, uh, no knowledge of the Hebrew children, just the fact that they were big. There were many of them. They outnumbered the people that took over plus the people that resided there. And they were afraid of them. And they made their burdens very onerous. In other words, they made them make bricks without straw. You know that whole story and so on. Uh, but then there, became a, there went out a decree that uh, because they were afraid of the Israelites, they, they were Hebrews, uh, because they were afraid of the Hebrews, that uh, male children were to, be, were to be put to death. In other words, Pharaoh called in the two midwives of the, of the Israelites and told them, can't call them Israelites yet because they weren't. Uh, they were sons of Jacob from generations before, 400 years before, but they weren't known as that yet. The Hebrews, and the Hebrew midwives came before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, now if it's a male child, put him to death. Uh, if it's a female child, it can last. But, of course, they didn't do that. Uh, fearing God and their people more than what Pharaoh threatened to do, they went in and lied before Pharaoh and said, well, we, you know, these, these Hebrew women, they're, they're athletic women. They get around, and they have their babies before we get there which wasn't exactly the truth, but nevertheless there were male children being born and, and the uh, Hebrews still continued to grow. So this is the setting because it's in this particular setting that Moses is born of Jochebed and his mother loves him and she wants to keep him. Now we'll come back to that in a minute. But let me share this with you. Uh, real mothers are special people. I saw this and I thought it was, uh, was kind of neat. It said, real mothers would like to be able to eat a whole candy bar all by themselves. <laughs> And drink a Coke without any floaters in it. I've been there as a daddy. <laughs> Real mothers know that their kitchen utensils are probably going to end up in the sandbox. 
Real mothers often have sticky floors, dirty ovens, and happy kids. Real mothers know that dried Play-Doh doesn't come out of Berber carpet. Real mothers sometimes ask, why me, and get their answer when a little voice says, because I love you best. Real mothers know that a child's growth is not measured by height or years or grade. It's marked by the progression of mama to mom to mother. And I thought that was, uh, I thought that was pretty neat. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes when I hear the stories of people whose lives, famous people that we know whose lives were uh, influenced by their mothers. And I, I usually like to refer to this at Mother's Day, and you've probably heard me say it before, but George Washington, uh, known as the father of our country, when he was 16 years old, uh, his family had purchased for him a commission in His Majesty's Royal Navy. And uh, he stood before his mother with a British uh, man of war anchored just off the coast at Mount Vernon. And 16-year-old George Washington stood before his mother. His trunks were packed. Um, there was a contingent of Royal Marines in the house with their fixed bayonets. And they were getting ready to take uh, George's trunks. He would be a lieutenant in the Navy. And uh, they were getting ready to take his trunks out to the uh, British man of war. And uh, his mother, as mothers will do, started weeping. <laughs> and uh, she, she said, uh, she threw her arms around his neck and she said, George, I just I can't bear to see you go. And uh, then in that moment, uh, one historical writer says, in that moment of time when a young man succumbed to uh, his mother's tears that the father of our nation was assured in that moment of time. Because just think, if he had gone on to be a, uh, captain in the Royal Navy. Uh, we wouldn't have had Valley Forge and we wouldn't have had the revolution and so on. But listen to these observations of new mothers. I, I was struck by this before we uh, look to the, to the references of Jochebed and Moses and what happened in his life. I thought this was fascinating because um, it kind of comes full circle. Parenting Magazine did uh, ask mothers, young mothers, to, to write some observations. And I thought this was neat. One, one young mother said, after I gave birth, what surprised me most was how much I needed my mom. I expected to want her to visit and to get to know her new grandson, but I never anticipated how much I would want her to take care of me. Despite my partner's good efforts and best intentions, nobody was able to take care of me as well as she did. My mom cooked three meals a day and cared for my every need. And as a result, I was able to focus all my attention and energy on my new role as a mom. And then another young lady said, no one ever told me that when I had to dig down deep and be the strongest advocate for my daughter while being her greatest source of comfort, I would. Every parent should know that there is nothing you can't do when you have to. Um, one mother wrote, uh, I didn't realize how silly I'd be. I'm normally pretty reserved. But whenever I'm with my little guy, I'm constantly talking, singing, making goofy faces and sounds. It's hard to say which of us enjoys it more. Uh, another young mother said, until the birth of my daughter, I didn't know how great it would be to let go of the many things I felt I needed to control. I knew my life would change when I became a mother, but I didn't know that most of my planning was basically pointless because the baby dictates how things will go, at least for the first two or three months. Um, someone said, uh, one young lady wrote, no one told me that I would learn more from my children than I would teach them regarding how to approach life. I, I like this observation. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that necessarily, but listen to what she says. She said, almost every day, my two sons wake up happy and excited to see what is in store for the rest of the day. And most days when I ask them what's, what was their favorite part of the day, their answer is everything. I love that. And I try to imitate their life view. Uh, what surprised me most about parenting? That it would bring my husband and I closer together. I know that might sound like a no-brainer, but everyone had told me how to, uh, to prepare for not having time for ourselves and for our relationship after the baby. I was worried that somehow the lack of sleep, extra stress, uh, all of that would be a challenge to our relationship. And while in some ways that can be true, I have found co-parenting has made us an even greater team. We share responsibilities, collaborate on problem solving, celebrate each other's achievements, and talk about the amazing love we share for our son. I would say that we are closer than ever. And then this last one that I really liked, and it'll, this is segues for us back to Moses and to Jochebed, his mother. I was most surprised by how much I realized my mom loved me. We have always been really close, but it wasn't until I held Tommy in my arms for the first time 
that I understood her love because I felt it towards him. Since he was born, I have made sure to let my mom know how much she means to me as well. Not only have I felt an increase of love with my son, but I've also felt a stronger connection to my own mom. And I, I like those observations because it helps us to put into perspective motherhood. We all have our own views. We all come to it uh, in a particular way. But I want you to see this about Moses because this unique character has, uh, in, in Hebrew history, nobody stands out any greater. In fact, uh, I think I've told you that Moses, uh, as a man, was privileged to see things that nobody else saw. When God took Moses and put him in the cliff of the rock when he gave him the law to the children of Israel, Moses was a man who, who got a glimpse of a part of God. He was a man who talked with God for two different months at a time, face to face, not exactly face to face, but uh, speaking as a person would to his friend. And, he, and God dictated the law to him, and Moses wrote it down on Mount Sinai. Uh, such a unique individual. He's known as the lawgiver, and yet not without his faults, not without his temper. Uh, the time that he killed the Egyptian as a young man uh, for beating the Hebrew slave and tried to bury his body in the sand. And a man saw it. And, and there are various things when, when, uh, when Moses, uh, j just the, the, there are so many things. We don't, don't need to take time to recount them all uh, to you now, except to say that in that moment when a flash of anger overtook his life. And my, how when we lose our temper, our direction in life can be changed and we don't even know it until... Uh, until after it's done, but in that flash of anger, when he struck the rock not once but twice, God told him, and God, when God gives commands, he wants them to be obeyed. I mean, to the letter. He never tells us to do something that we can't do. He never gives us more than we're able to do. He never tells us to do something but what he doesn't expect, the very thing that he tells us to do. Precisely, God is a precise God. He is a precise God, and he gave Moses the commands for bringing fresh water out of the rock. He was disobedient, and God said, you'll not see the promised land. Now, that's amazing to me, because in his life, nobody saw what Moses saw. Nobody was in God's presence like Moses was. The second time he came down off the mountain, his face shone with such glory that he had to cover his face with a veil. And yet, in losing his temper, he lost sight of that which had so richly blessed his life. And he did not cross the Jordan. He did not. He was able to go up on the mountain and look across to the land flowing with milk and honey. But he did not make that crossing into it because he had disobeyed God. And then later, uh, the archangel Michael contends with Satan for the body of Moses. What was that about? Wow. We get just a little vignette. In the scripture that's referred to in the New Testament, that this, there's this great battle that takes place between heaven's forces and the forces of evil over the battle of Moses, uh, the battle for Moses' body. And yet we see him transfigured on the mount with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. Now, this man, Moses, then, I want, what I'm trying to do is to put him into perspective for you because his birth. There were such simple things that took place at his birth. The very first point that I want you to see this morning is very simply this. Moses lived because he had two mothers that loved him. Moses lived because he had two mothers that loved him. Jochebed, when she saw him as a beautiful child, and what mother doesn't see their baby? He must have been a handsome man, though, because the scripture says, refers several times to the fact that he was a beautiful baby. But what mother doesn't think that her babies are beautiful? And uh, the word says that this Jochebed took uh, bulrushes and fashioned them into a little, uh, a little ark and filled it with pitch so that it wouldn't leak and so on and floated him in order, uh, when he was three months old, in order to keep him alive. And then Pharaoh's daughter comes and sees him. Now, I want you to see something, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very sensitive here. Um, Moses was born into a culture of death. Moses was born into a culture of death. You see, not only had those who came in and took over the, um, the land of Egypt, they made the Egyptian slave along, uh, slaves, along with secular history tells us that, along with the Hebrews being slaves, but the culture of death was kill the children when they're born. Now, friends, when we lose a million and a half to 1.6, maybe 1.7 million babies a year, it worries me that we've become a culture of death. I mean, that's a significant number of children not being born. And we're seeing this 
the horrendous tales of this Gosnell trial on TV and, and how, how absolutely horrible. But we, we live our lives in such a way that we just really don't want to think about those things sometimes. And yet we have the opportunity to help. We have the opportunity to participate. We have the opportunity to make our voices known. But Moses had two mothers who loved him, an adopted mother and his natural mother who loved him. And how important it was because he was going to rely upon both of those mothers for the things that they taught him. As long as he was under the tutelage of his Hebrew mother, he began to learn things about the Hebrew faith, about her walk with God. And I want to put this together like the pieces of a giant puzzle in just a moment. But I do want you to see that Moses had two mothers. He lived because they loved him. The second point is very simply this. Moses grew because they gave. His Hebrew mother gave him life from the beginning. His Egyptian mother gave him everything that money could buy. He was known as uh, of Pharaoh's household. Now, y'all, that meant open doors everywhere. That meant privilege. That meant power. That meant the best teachers. That meant the best schools. That meant the best of the learning of that day and time. And we can't make too little of it because, you see, they were able to do things that we still wonder how they did today. I mean, when you look at the pyramids of Giza, and when you understand the construction of a pyramid, and when you understand the calculations of stars, and when you understand how they understood things about the universe that's been lost to history. Now, it's not to say that we don't have a finer and more sharper focus today, because we do, obviously. But still, there was some wonderful knowledge, and the best knowledge of the day was at the command of the Pharaoh's household. This, these were the people who, uh, and the... And the, the uh, the uh, library that was in Alexandria in Egypt was the finest in the ancient world until it was destroyed by fire. It was absolutely incredible. My, what a wealth of knowledge was contained in, in, is contained in those ruins that lie buried under the sands of time. And all of this was available to Moses. Now, the, his Hebrew mother could not give him what his adopted mother gave him. But his adopted mother could not give him what his Hebrew mother gave him. And you say, what, what are you talking about? Well, and I want to move to the third point. And that is very simply this. One gave him goods. The other one gave him God. Now, I have to refer to the writer to the Hebrews when, in order to put the pieces of this puzzle together for you. And it's in the 11th chapter, in that great chapter on faith. And they're just these few verses, but I want you to hear them because I think it will help us to understand uh, what we're shooting at this morning on Mother's Day. In the 23rd chapter of the 11th chapter of Hebrews, now remember, there, I've said to you over and over again that there are chapters that need to light up in your mind. They need to send off a little whistle in your brain that this is a significant chapter. Hebrews 11, the chapter on faith. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, listen to this, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather. Now listen, here's the, here's the prophecy. I, I wish that I had time. If you'd stay here for the next three hours, I'd tell you how this works out and the significance behind it and the spiritual importance of it. But just hear these words and let the Spirit of God apply the truth to your heart. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of, of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ. How does Christ get into this picture? How does Christ come into the picture? We understand about faith, the chapter on faith, but how does Christ get into the picture regarding Moses and his choices in life? Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures, than the treasures. One mother gave him goods, one mother gave him God. 
than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing, and here him is capitalized. Seeing Jesus. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And there in that great chapter of faith in Hebrews 11 is encapsulated the stark extreme differences of the life that Moses chose to follow God rather than to live the life that, of privilege and pleasure that he could have lived in the land of Egypt. Now, here's, here's a startling fact that you may or may not have put together in this brief moment of time. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Moses wrote the book of Genesis. How did he know this? Now, and I back away from this and say, yes, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God who gave him the words to write down, but I want to tell you that I believe with all of my heart that when one mother gave him God, what did she give him of the Hebrew faith that caused him to be so endowed with power from on high that he could take these people claim and of course we know all about his being in the wilderness and the burning bush and coming back to Egypt and bringing Aaron and standing before the Pharaoh and the ten plagues and so on but listen this man had a knowledge when when he stood before the bush and God told him he said tell the children of Israel I am that I am hath sent thee where did his knowledge of that I am come from? It came from his mother. It came from his mother. What did she have to share with him? She didn't have the Bible to share with him. It wasn't written. Moses wrote the first five books. There probably wasn't anything in print yet except maybe the book of Job. What did she share with him? She shared with him her faith in the living God. She shared with him the truth about the God who created this earth. She shared with him the stories of Adam and Eve and Cain. She shared with him the story of Noah and the ark. That was all they had at this time until Moses put it down in print. But she shared with him the faith of a God who had brought her to this point. The, you see, the tribes were already established. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was Jacob's sons that made up the 12 tribes who came to, who, who, who were now maybe as many as a million people in Egypt. But do you see the desperate importance? And, and I want to say to you that there are not many people who have to make the choices between goods and God, but sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. Uh, I have the feeling that mothers make a choice today that determines the direction of their children's lives. What am I going to give my child? What am I going to give my child? Am I going to give him goods? Or am I going to give him God? And they're not mutually exclusive. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Sadly, we make it that way. What are we going to give our children? Who are we going to give to our children? Are we going to give them our stories of faith? Are we capable of sharing with them this God who called us, who leads us, who directs our lives, in whom we have placed our faith to the point that we live where we live, at his direction. And that, that's what it comes down to for me, finally. Uh, the choice that Moses made to the point where he became the leader of his people, led them out of captivity, saw God face to face, wrote down the commandments until to this day, he is known as the lawgiver, saw things that no man ever saw except for Moses. And why was that? Because a mother at his birth loved him and gave him direction. And oh, I just pray that we will do before our children and do to our children what God wants us to because uh, the direction of our nation is going to be determined. Uh, 
by how faithful, I believe, by how faithful we are in our families to give to the next generation the truth of who God is and what he wants to do in us. Y'all come and share with us a closing, okay? All right. As you're willing and able, will you stand once again and join us? Our closing song is Your Grace is Enough. who have led us and helped to fashion our lives. And Lord, we pray for more mothers who would be so inclined to follow God that the course of a nation would be changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>